Welcome to the Brunton Bugle, a podcast focusing on the trials and tribulations of Carl United Football Club. From Mattia Manset to Ben Marshall and John Ward to Tim Ward, we've got it covered. This is episode 20 and today we're going to be looking back at the banana skin narrowly avoided against Hayes and Yedding United in last weekend's FA Cup first round game. Previewing this weekend's return to league action against Cheltenham Town, rounding up the latest news from Brunton Park and a look at what X-Blues have been getting up to over the last week and that is a busy section that one, I tell you that much. Uh, I'm joined on this episode by one of my regular co-hosts, and today it's Mike Booth. Mike, how's it going? Yes, going good. Matthew Manset, that's one hell of a name to yeah. pluck out there. Well, do you not know where the connection is between the... Uh... I'm guessing it's Chel- they've played for Cheltenham at they, some point. They've all been involved at Cheltenham at some point, yeah. so obviously uh, Matthew Manset had a very brief spell with us. Didn't actually score a goal, did he? he at that game against Yeovil, he, he sort of bundled his way through, and then Luke Ayling, who plays for Leeds now in the Premier League, mad that... Scored a spectacular own goal, putting it past his own keeper. Ben Marshall, obviously, we all very well remember him for his 50 plus games for us. Um, he obviously had a spell at Cheltenham before he came to us. Uh, Tim Ward is from Cheltenham and he played for Cheltenham for years and obviously he managed United for a season, I think, in the 60s. And Tim uh, John Ward, of course, managed both clubs. Um, yeah. He got him from Cheltenham. So, yeah, there's the connection to today's uh, names. Um, like I said, we've got a busy news section. Let's get straight into it then, Mike. So, uh, News roundup, and first up, <laughs> didn't think we'd have to say this again until January, uh, new signing. So um, this would have been very much off the hot, hot, hot off the press if we'd recorded it last night, but we didn't for various reasons. So uh, some almost breaking news here is that um, United have made a new signing. Uh, defender Reese Bennett has joined the Blues on a short-term deal until January. Bennett was available on a free transfer after leaving Peterborough United at the end of last season. He started his career at Bolton Wanderers. He had a half-season loan at Spell at Falkirk, I think he did quite well there by all accounts, before leaving to join Rochdale. He spent four years there where his assistant manager was, of course, none other than the United boss, Chris Beach. Uh, then he moved on to Mansfield, uh, where he was under the management of Steve Evans. And he moved with Evans when he went to Peterborough, I think a couple of years later. Uh, spent two years at Peterborough before his departure this summer. Good experienced player, he can play across the back four and even in midfield. It, you've got to think, Mike, this is a move to sort of build up his fitness properly. And get him signed on a longer deal in January, you'd think, wouldn't you? Yeah, you'd think so. But, I mean, you can kind of just have players train them with you without a contract. The only difference with the contract is they can actually play in competitive games. So, um, it'll be interesting to see if, if he features maybe in the um, trophy that we don't talk about. Um mm. He, he, might, he might get some minutes in that, I don't know. But um, yeah. yeah, he's got good experience and, and Beach seemed to be suggesting that he had interest from clubs at a higher level than us. So That's, uh, that's the bit that stood out to me, the fact that he mm. said, oh, there's clubs at a higher level that are showing interest, but you know, we've been patient. And It's interesting how the way Beach was talking is the fact that clubs at a higher level are sort of making promises to players that they can't really keep in the current mm. climate. Whereas <laughs> we're in a quite fortunate position, aren't we, that we can sort of, maybe not key promises but we can be more realistic but still offer a fairly decent terms because of yeah. the situation money wise the fact we've made a bit of money from transfers and that kind of thing so so yeah I, I think it's, a, it's not an area I did think we needed to sort of sign any players for but we were quite well covered there but yeah. I think as others have said the best thing to do when you're doing well is to improve your base, really, isn't it? Really, yeah. So, it, it's good that we're not like quality. resting on our laurels. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and this isn't like the the old days under Curl, where towards the end of the season we were signing players just for the sake of filling a squad mm. space. When you could have easily put a YTS player on the bench and he would have done exactly the same job. You know, your mm. junior Jerry Chims, your Ben Tomlinsons, and <laughs> Pete. Oh my God, the names rip, roll off the tongue, don't they? Not, not mm. for the right reasons, unfortunately. No. So you know, it's one of those places you look at and you think. That's genuinely adding a good bit of quality to the squad, actually. Yeah, and, you know, and experience as well, because we don't actually have a ton of that, really, do we? 
Yeah, and experience. And he can cover a number of positions as well, which definitely helps too. Mm. And we saw, obviously, at the weekend, obviously, we'll, we'll discuss later, but the potential risk with coronavirus at the moment, you know, you could be losing the odd player here and there occasionally. So you've got to be very careful, don't you? So, so yeah, so uh, welcome to Brunton Park. Reese. hopefully he'll do pretty well. I think he's one who could, you know, spend quite a bit of time with us. Actually, I don't think he's one who's going to be gone again in January. I, I, I just think it's a... Uh, with a view to a long-term deal, I think. That's the way it's Yeah, hopefully. Um, okay, next up, FA Cup draws. So United, as we've already mentioned, are through to the next round of the FA Cup, the senior one, if you want to call it that. And they will face League One side Doncaster Rovers in the next round. The game will be played on the weekend, the Saturday set, 28th of November. Uh, it's not been selected as one of the TV games this time. I thought there was a small chance, really, because there wasn't really many standout games in this draw, was there? It was a kind of a weird one. Mm. Um so it's not going to be on TV. So I'd imagine it's going to be three o'clock on the Saturday. Maybe it'll push an earlier kickoff to fit around travel and stuff like that. But Doncaster's not that far to go, is it? So no. three o'clock makes more sense. So, so yeah, we imagine it's going to be three o'clock. Not being confirmed yet, but that'll be in a couple of weeks' time. Additionally, United under eighteen side will now know who they're going to face in the next round of the FA Youth Cup, and it's going to be. Bradford City. Now, I think we played Bradford City in this competition last season, didn't we? But that might have been in the first round. We went out on extra time. So uh, that game is going to take place on Thursday, the 19th of November, with a 6 p.m. kickoff. And the club will once again be streaming the game live on their YouTube channel, which is, I think, official CUFC, I think it is, isn't it? Um, mm. Well worth watching that. I watched the first round game. It was really entertaining. The lads played some really good football against a, a very spirited Chester side. Uh, this will probably be a tougher test, so should be quite a close game. Good one to watch that one, I think. Um, yeah, so yeah, so yeah, both both teams through into the next round of the the various FA Cup competitions. So let's hopefully give them a watch. Um, not sure exactly what will happen actually with the Doncaster game in terms of streaming. I'm guessing they'll probably just try and do it through the iFollow model. I don't see any reason why they would change the system really, but it may be one of those ones where they're not able to use iFollow because it's only for league games. I don't know, but. That's yeah, I haven't got a clue to be honest. I mean, I remember there was something with the licensing for cup games in sort of before I follow, wasn't there? I mean, you could, well, the sort of predecessor of I follow, you could listen online for league games, but you couldn't on BBC's iPlayer thing. Yeah, but you it is could that for FA Cup games. Or that something. is the case with this one. You can yeah. you can listen to the game for free on the BBC Sounds app for yeah. the FA Cup games. So. So second round, you'll be able to listen to James and uh, Lummy on BBC Sounds. Um, next up, a uh, little bit dated now this because we've just found out who's won it, but uh, the Manager and Player of the Month for nominations. So uh, the EFL League 2 manager, Player and Manager of the Month nominations were announced earlier this week and United midfielder John Mellish and boss Chris Beach were both up for the award. Uh, Mellish was obviously in a rich run of form with four league goals in the month and Beach had led us to four wins, two draws and one defeat during the period. Unfortunately, neither of them won the award. I, I don't think I was particularly surprised about this because I think it was Mike Flynn, the Newport manager, won it. Obviously, they were top of the league. Um, they only lost the game when they played us, and that was in November anyway. So, mm. And the player of the award was uh, Paul Mullen. And to be fair, I think he scored something stupid like eight goals in the month, didn't he? So, but yeah. hat-trick for there. So no real complaints about that. But just nice to see a bit of recognition for the pair of them. And to be honest, John keeps up his form. <laughs> He'll probably be up for it again this month. So yeah, yeah definitely. Know. The way he's scoring, so yeah, so yeah, just a nice bit of recognition there for the lads. Uh, kickoff times changing, so there's another two kickoff times have been switched. This time, our trip to Crawley a week on Saturday that will now kick off at 1 30 pm, and our jaunt to the Wirral to face Tramir Rovers a few days later will now kick off at seven o'clock. Interesting, all these kickoff change times. It's one maybe we'll discuss on another episode, but it'll be interesting to see what happens once football returns back to normal, if you call it that as to mm. whether they do stick with these changes to kickoff times. I and mean, I can see reasons why they might and why they wouldn't, but it'll be an interesting one. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm of the belief if it's not broken, don't fix it. I mean, you and me have done a few Tuesday night games where mm. you've clocked off work at five and we've, like, raced it down yeah. or up the motorway to, to get there. And if there were an earlier kickoff time than 7.45, we probably wouldn't have made it. Yeah, it'd be tighter, wouldn't it? But then... I suppose there's issues with, you know, people who take kids to the games, would they be more inclined to take them to the game if it's a seven o'clock kickoff and then get home nice mm. and early, possibly, things like that? I don't know. Um, okay, uh, finally, we've sort of touched 
the other week on the fact that Dean Furman got his international call up, but Joshua Coyote has joined him uh, on international duty, not in the same country, that'd be a bit weird. Um, so he's earned his second call up to the Republic of Ireland under 21 squad for their UEFA European under 21 championship qualifiers against Iceland and Luxembourg. I think um, the Iceland game is possibly today, I think, maybe. Uh, not 100% of that one. It might, or in fact, no, it might be on Sunday. And I think he's got one in midweek as well. It might be the way it works. But um, nice to see Joshua getting a bit of a recognition again. I think there's a good chance he'll play at least one of those games, you'd think, wouldn't you? Yeah. I'm surprised he so. didn't. Um, so both players are going to miss the Cheltenham Town and Aston Villa under 23 games. Um, it's worth noting that Furman's call ups caused a bit of controversy in South Africa, hasn't it? I think I've, mm. I've seen a few tweets from there. Uh, South Africa fans up in arms about the fact that uh, a League Two player has been called <laughs> up, and fair play to them. You see, English football fans always use this jokey Farmers League thing about the French league and things like that, mm. don't they? I saw someone, one of the one of the South African fans, tweeting uh, that Dean Furman's taken some some time off from his farming job to come on international <laughs> duty for them. But then, uh, if they're going to be smart asses about it, I'll point out the fact that I had a good look at the uh, average attendances in the top flight in the South African league, and we'd be in mid table for average attendances in that league. So yeah, to stick that in your pipe and smoke, I can say yeah. that because because none of them are listening. I've looked at the map, <laughs> so there you go. Um, but yeah, so uh, it does appear actually as an elite sportsman, uh, Furman would only have to isolate for 72 hours after returning with a negative test. So the second game he plays in is on Monday the 16th of November in South Africa. Now, despite the fact this is the away tie against Sao Tome and Principe, it's actually being played in South Africa for logistical reasons and the fact that, you know, there's risks of their players having to travel back from South Africa and South Africa players having to go over there. Just... I think they just all agreed it was sensible just to play the game, both games in South Africa. Um, so he should be available for the trip to Crawley Town, or he won't have been able to train potentially. So whether he would maybe be rested for that game as well, I don't know. I'm not sure what the deal is with Coyote in terms of his isolation and all that, but I'd imagine there's probably rules between the Republic of Ireland and the UK that makes it a little bit easier, maybe. I don't mm. know. Um, but I did get actually heads up from one of our listeners there because he was a... Uh, involved with that in Norway recently actually in terms of dealing with elite sportsmen and their visas so you are telling me uh, the, the full crack on that yeah, he'll love his little shout out there he always does uh, okay so let's move on to the match review Mike um, Hayes and Yenning 2 Carl United 2 so by some miracle United are through to the second round of the season's FA Cup by the skin of their teeth Thanks once again to that man, John Mellish, isn't it? Um, scored his third brace of the season already, making it into double figures for the campaign too. I mean, I, you watched this same time as me, didn't you, Mike? And mm. My word, that was horrible watching in extra time, particularly, wasn't it? Um, one of those games where you, you had this sinking feeling when we went to extra time and that first goal went in. And I think Dan actually made a comment, didn't he, about the name of the goal scorer, uh, yeah, Nash, yeah. Nasher. He said, he just sounds like one of those players you hear about being a hero in the FA Cup, don't you? <laughs> yeah. And literally, like, two minutes later, he scored the second goal, and you think, yeah. just that's just prophetic, isn't it? Um, but fair play, Big John steps up, doesn't he, and uh, gets the two goals, and we're, we're through to the next round. Yeah, I mean, he, he didn't stop running, did he? I mean, deep into extra time, it was obvious that the Hayes and Yedden players were getting tired, but Mellish is just an absolute machine. He just does not stop running at all. In fact, I can't even, to be honest, I can't recall a player with as much sort of work rate and stamina as him, to be honest. he's um, And considering he's naturally a centre-back who aren't exactly renowned for their athleticism, typically, um, it's it's outstanding. And, you know, typically, two minutes left of a game that we're losing 2-0 a couple of years ago, I might have turned over and watched Holmes under the hammer or something. But you know, it, it, you just you don't want to give up on this team. Like you know, even even when you know your backs are against the wall and things are looking against you, you can never ever sort of write us off. And that showed. And I think once we got the equaliser, obviously the Hayes and Yen players, their heads just went, didn't they? And I think there was only ever going to be one winner in, in the shootout. But it, it, it's a weird game because we had some very good chances. Like, it shouldn't have gone to extra time, really. You know, we had some fantastic chances, but you've got to take them, haven't you? And we didn't. And it, again, it, it, it's become a talking point that our strikers, are, they're not scoring enough goals. Yeah, well, that's one we'll come to in a minute. That's one of the talking points I picked out from the game. Um, Beach did make a number of changes. I think McDonald and Devine missed out over a 
potential coronavirus concern, wasn't there? Because mm. McDonald woke up with a sore throat and Divine travels in with, with McDonald in his car. Um, thankfully, both of them have got uh, negative tests back, so they're both OK and should be available this weekend. Um, we st- we created some good chances, but we st- I still think we struggled a little bit to, to break down what was a dogged and... I give them a lot of credit. Very well organised Hazen Yedding side. We have a couple of good players who could play a bit of football there. You can you can see why they've done well over the last couple of seasons, can't you? Because they've they've got some mm. talented lads and very typical for one of these sort of London commuter town football clubs, aren't they? And the, the you know they, they pick up these players who are released by big club academies, don't they? Aren't probably quite good enough even to get in the football league, um, and they've clearly got ability, but you know they just haven't quite found their level yet and and yeah it, it the stats do show that we dominate but i think it was a lot closer than it sort of let on wasn't it and gws had to make a couple of really smart saves as well didn't he um mm. to say that as well give him some credit there let's move on to the talking points then mike uh taking chances is the first one i picked out so beach made five changes as we said there to the side that beat newport in midweek and it could be argued that not many of those who came in to the side took their chance to impress i think Hunt looked solid enough again, and I think he showed the fact he's capable of stepping up into the team when he's needed. And Dewhurst did well in the penalty shootout, made a couple of good saves in normal time. But the rest, you could argue, didn't suggest that you know they're going to keep their place in the side this weekend, did they? No, I mean I'm I'm getting sort of a bit more inclined the more I see of Patrick to think that he's very good coming off the bench, but maybe shouldn't be starting games. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't really know. I mean, he missed a very good chance that he... I think he hit the bar um, when the ball came in from the right. I think it was Tanner that laid it off to him. Um, and Riley obviously hit, hit the post with that glorious uh, one-on-one. But yeah, no, no one has sort of really, you know, given themselves the right to knock on Beach's door and say, look, I should be starting in the league because, you know, it... Yeah, I mean, if it's a pick a man of the match, you'd probably say... Hunt, maybe? Yeah, I, we, I think we both said, didn't we, on mm. Sunday, we both felt Hunt was man in the match. He looks very comfortable with the ball. He, that's surprised how two-footed he was, actually, because he took a couple of free kicks right-footed, but then he was playing the ball with his left a lot, so he, he, he's one of those players you know he could probably play either side of the centre-back. Mm. So I, I, I genuinely think there's a really good player in Hunt, and I think he's one of these ones who Aaron Hayden's playing so well, you'd imagine bigger clubs are going to show interest soon. Mm. If he did leave, I wouldn't be too concerned about Hunt having to step in it might take him a bit of time to get to the level that Hayden's reached but I think he's mm. got the ability there to do that in terms of Patrick I think he just needs a few games to get up to rhythm his biggest problem is he keeps getting these niggling little injuries doesn't he and mm. he, he can't get a run in the side and that that's where what we want to get from him because as you say when he runs at tip even on Sunday when he runs at players they're terrified of him mm. he's, he's very different in Toure's got quite a languid style, doesn't he, with his thing? And he, he doesn't ever look like he's at full pelt, but the ball mm. just sticks to him and he's just so big and physical. He sort of glides past players, whereas Patrick is so rapid, he just seems to burst past them in seconds, doesn't he? And mm. they do seem a little bit terrified of him. I think he just basically needs to get... He needs to get three or four games where he's getting half an hour on as a sub, maybe, to mm. build up his fitness to the, the point where you think, right, I can just drop him into the team now when he's needed. That's what we really need from him. Like I said, from the rest, Furman was okay, but he didn't really shine in the same way that Guy has recently. Mm. And Jack Armour, all right, but again, didn't look quite as solid. Anderton probably looked more solid when he came on, although arguably Anderton was maybe at fault for a couple of the goals, really. That might be just that he wasn't up to speed in the game when he yeah, came in for Armour. Yeah, I think Anderton offered a lot more going forward as well than, uh, than Armour did. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so that, that sort of rounded that bit up. Blunt attack, so you sort of touched on this, Mike, briefly there before. Another game passes and the forwards failed to score. So now in the last 10 games, if we're not including the pizza uh, cup for that, um, it's 10 games since Patrick and Coyote scored against South End back in September. And in those games, only Alessandra has scored amongst the forwards and that was a penalty and an overhit cross. Is it really time that they should be stepping up and contributing? I know we've been quite big fans of Riley on the show, haven't we? And we, we defended him a little bit. But he's, as Dan says, he's not like freshening them miles wide, is he? He's hitting the woodwork and he's just mm. putting the wide of the post. But he's got to get to a point soon where he's got to put one of them away, hasn't he? Otherwise, people are going to start saying, you know, one of those players who works hard, a bit like a Craig Curran, but he just doesn't quite have enough to 
mm. finish the chances. And we've seen he can finish them. You know, he's in mm. Scotland for Queen of the South and St. Mirren, and even in his brief spell at Cheltenham last season, he, he showed he can do it. But mm. he's just not quite there yet, is he? No, and I, th- I think he's one of them as well. Once he gets one, I think there'll be no stopping him. But it's just getting that, getting that first goal, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it's it's just I don't I don't know what it is because I mean, I, I, Alessandra. To, to be fair, I mean for, for for me, you know, when everyone's sort of fit and available. Although Dickinson, you know, we haven't seen him yet really. But it's got to be uh, Alessandra, um, Coyote, and Torre. Um, but I mean, Alessandra, his link-up play is fantastic. You'd have him in the team for that. He's, he's one of them. You, you, we didn't sign him to be a goal scorer, did we? Really? Um, hmm. Well, but, we missed we missed him on Saturday. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Yeah. He, he, from the start, at least. Anyway, he did, we, we really could have done with him at the start. I think he would have made a big difference to the team for that mm. game, wouldn't he? But yeah, definitely. But Coyote is the one who's sort of meant to be the goal scorer, I, I think, and he, he he's not. He's not scoring goals, and I think if he didn't have his long throw in his locker, he would have been dropped. Yeah, I think to be fair on him as well, he's been shifted out wide for the last couple of games, hasn't he? And mm. I think actually, prior to this weekend's game, he was playing quite well <laughs> out wide. He just didn't have a great game against Hayes and Yedding, I don't think. Um, mm. That said, his long throw came good for the first time in a while, didn't it? To set up <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the second goal for Mellish. Although, watching back from other angles, was that a foul by Max Hunt? On their player, do you think? Never, never, no, not having it. <laughs> <laughs> I, to be fair, you watch it back; it's as blatant at elbow as you'll ever see, isn't it? Really, proper took the lad out. Fair play to him; it was a clever move because no, none of the officials spotted it. Mm. So, uh, and it did push him out of the way, and Melly then obviously turns on it and puts it in the back of the net. Yeah, I, I think <sighs> there's an argument even Toure needs to contribute as well when he comes back in because obviously we were talking about the fact mm. that how good he was, but. He still hadn't scored in the league yet, has he? He's only scored that no. goal in the in the Pizza Trophy, so yeah. But he's another. He's he's been hitting the post, hasn't he? It's like he's so close to yeah. getting that goal. You know, genuinely and... think we're going to batter someone in the league sooner or later. Yeah, Problem is we've I got some so. tough games coming up. That's one of the next two games in the league are tough ones, aren't they? Really? So yeah. Although you know, I mean, we beat Newport, and Newport yeah. up to this point have been the best team in the league. So we, we've no one to fear, to be honest with you. No. No, definitely not. Um, okay, let's get on to the final talking point here. Keep on running. So, once again, our staying power, I think you sort of touched on this briefly about Mellish particularly, but our staying power paid off with a couple of late goals to save the game. Beach sort of mentioned Fergie time, wasn't he, in his interviews this week. Mm. How vital is our ability to play till the end of the game and our fitness levels going to be this season? And will it catch up on us eventually, do you reckon? Um, I think it'll certainly catch up on us if we don't rotate a little bit because we really haven't been rotating at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's absolutely. Cr- I think this season as well, because of everything that's gone on, teams do have, you know, a big massive run of fixtures, and we obviously are included in that. We also have a big massive run of fixtures. But um, yes, so, I mean, there's quite a few teams. I mean, we we look quite fortunate in that we have quite a young squad. But there's quite a few teams where the bulk of the squad is sort of knocking on over 30 and mm. these these sorts of players that they, they they do they do struggle with playing Saturday Tuesday Saturday Tuesday so you know I mean you, you want that sort of extra 10% wherever you can get it and if that's if that's where we're getting it and there's you know plenty of late drama <laughs> you know uh, long may it continue yeah so uh, it'd be interesting to see how that pans out over the next few weeks like you say in terms of the we need to start re- rotating a few players don't we I think it's Getting to the point now where some of them are starting to look a little bit tired. Got the chance to do that on the weekend, and I'd, I'd imagine you're going to see a lot of changes to that Villa game. I mean, I don't know what the rules are still with that. I mean, it's all right for Villa to put a load of youngsters out. Oh, yeah, we'll probably get fined if we wanted to basically drop the whole first team for that game. Yeah, well, I think Wolves played a £35 million Portuguese player the other day, didn't How, they? Outrageous that. And mm. Do you see the tweet they put up about that, the people who run the Papa John's yeah, Trophy yeah. Twitter thing? They put mm. an original one up, deleted it, because they got so mm. much abuse, mm. and then put a second one up and just got exactly the same. And people saying, like, mm. this just is rubbing it in everyone's faces after the comments. To, that to, It's all short, goes back to Sean Harvey, doesn't it, and his bloody mm. comments about it, so... To be fair, though, when the Football League said it would help the national team, I don't actually think they specifically said which <laughs> national team. Yeah, exactly so, that. Exactly yeah. that. So there you go. Uh, okay, I think we've pretty much discussed everything we want to talk about there, Mike, haven't we? I don't think mm. there's anything else you want to talk about. No, no, I think we've, we've covered all bases. Yeah, should we briefly touch about the dreadful TV coverage? 
<laughs> oh, God, that's just painful. It's almost a godsend that we're not going to be on the BBC for the next game because I, I, I wonder if it's one of those issues, the fact that it's a smaller ground and they maybe didn't have the same internet connection and stuff mm. like that that other teams have. But you'd think they'd have had a TV truck there or something, but... They, well, that's the thing. I mean, people have grabbed by iFollow, but iFollow's a million miles ahead of that, you know that what? BBC I, coverage. Maybe I'm lucky, but I've never had a major problem with iFollow. I know you've, you've had a couple of problems with it, but mm. when it works, it's perfect. And the, at least they show replays of the goals as well and stuff like that, and the audio yeah. commentary it syncs up perfectly. So I've never had a major problem with it, to be brutally honest. But, but there yeah, I've, I've had a few games where it's only worked on my phone. I've been <laughs> watch, watching a full game on the phone, like in the corner of my bedroom with my phone on charge, because obviously it just absolutely drained the battery. But... Mm. You know, you at least get to see it without a bloody error message coming up. Yeah, that's very true. Very true. Okay, Mike, I think that's the end of part one then. So we'll be back shortly for part two. Where we'll be looking ahead to the weekend six pointer against Cheltenham at Brunton Park. So back in a sec. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're into part two now where we're going to be looking ahead to another tough clash, this time against another side chasing promotion this season, Cheltenham Town. So let's get straight into the interesting facts here, Mike. So Cheltenham Town was originally thought to have been formed in 1892, but new evidence emerged recently that suggests it was set up five years earlier, that in 1887. Their nickname is the Robins, and they've played at three different grounds. Ag Gardner's Recreation Ground, Carter's Field, and now Wadden Road, which is known for commercial reasons as the World of Smile Stadium. What an that's, awful name for I mean, a that's stadium. <laughs> nearly up there is the, with the Wham Stadium and the, is it, what, Morecambe now, Mizuma Stadium, yeah. I think it is, something like that. You get some dreadful names at this level, don't you? It's about, it amazes me that they haven't thought about doing that for Brunton Park yet. I'm glad they haven't. I think they'd be right if they did. Yeah. Well, they're such, such traditionalists, our fans, aren't they? Yeah. You know? They'll complain about the fact that the toilets are in absolute state in the Warwick Road in, but if you say, well, we're going to rename the ground after, I don't know, XL Cheese Crisps or something like that, <laughs> right? Just think of the most cumbering thing I could think of there. Yeah. Uh, so we could pay for it. They'd be an absolute riot, wouldn't they? That's be yeah, terrible, wouldn't it? so, although to be fair, the funny story about the Warwick Road toilets is I was in there uh, oh, going back years I, now. Do you know what? Can I stop you here, right? This better be a clean story, really, because it's a story that starts a story about the Warwick Road end toilets. Doesn't seem like it's going to end well, quite frankly. No, well, it was absolutely chucking it down with rain, and this bloke turns to me next to me while we're doing our thing against the wall. There goes, "It's like being at home. This I can have a piss while having a shower." <laughs> uh, and anyone who's ever, I can imagine, we might have some uh, ladies listening to this who probably haven't been into the Warwick Road End men's toilets. It's basically essentially a wall with a trough, isn't it? And there's yeah. no there's no roof to it. I mean, there's chicken wire mm. to stop people getting in. And that's about it. It's years since I've been in. And by the sounds of things, it's not changed since then. So, no. um, so yeah, anyway, back on track here, Mike. Uh, Cheltenham has a history of football prior to the Robins in 1849. The first use of three official referees in a match. Two in field and one in tribune. I don't know what in tribune means, but I found this on Wikipedia, so there you go. Was recorded in the town. So the first time three officials were using a game was in Cheltenham. Interesting that. Um, the Cheltenham Town were first promoted into the Football League in 1999 and have been there ever since, moving between League 1 and League 2 regularly. Their most famous manager is Steve Cotterill, who got them promoted into the league and left after guiding them through to the FA Cup fifth round and promotion to the second division through the playoffs. Um, they're one of these kind of clubs, aren't they, Cheltenham, who, like... <laughs> Previously, I used to always think them well, they're non league club when they first came in, but now you just feel like they're an established football league club, don't you? And you don't mm. really see them. Like, like I still look at, no disrespect them to Crawley Town, for instance, and I still think they're sort of a non league club. They're sort of mm. ma- masquerading as a football league club when clubs like Wrexham and Chesterfield are, and Notts County are languishing in the National League and mm. you know clubs like that. And even Forest Green, I still part of me thinks yeah, they're, <laughs> they're a non league club. What are they doing up here? I've got a traditional idea in my head of who league clubs are. But <laughs> Cheltenham Town feel like one of those clubs now, don't they? They're very much established. And I don't. I think they've maybe only once been under threat of going down back to the conference, haven't they? I think they've always just basically either been mid-table League 2 or balanced it up and down between League 2 and League 1, haven't they? 
Yeah, and you know they're, they're quite a testament, really, because they, they they don't get massive gates, but they, you know they, they uh, you know they don't have a big ground or anything, but they, they're always sort of dipping between leagues one and two, like you say, and. But know, they don't. Good, they don't get dread. Them. They don't get dreadful gates either. Do they? I think that their average is not much below ours. I don't think, and they're not like a. You look at the Accringtons and your Salfords and your Forest Greens, who sometimes struggle to get two thousand to a game. Mm. They're not like quite at those levels, are they? Really, I think they're mm. three thousand plus ish. And obviously, when they get up to League One, they generally about four or five thousand. So, mm. so you know that they're they're a good established club, and you know they they cover a decent area as well. And Forest Green obviously encroach on that now. But um, but yeah, head to heads between United and Cheltenham, uh, very very balanced this, isn't it? So um, in the league, we've won ten. There's been eight draws and eight Cheltenham wins. In the cup, there's been two Cheltenham wins. That's both in the FA Cup, and that obviously means in total ten Carlisle wins, eight draws, and ten Cheltenham wins. Interesting one here, Mike. How long do you reckon the gap was between our first and second games against Cheltenham Town? I'm going to say, like, 60 years. You're absolutely bang on there, pretty much. I'm actually... 66 years. Uh, So the the first time we played them was in on the 9th of December, 1933, in the FA Cup, where we lost 2-1. That was at Brunton Park, actually. That's a hell of a trip. That would have been from Cheltenham back then with Mm. no motorways and stuff like that. (laughs) God, can you imagine? So, yeah, they they Mm. beat us 2-1. That would have been a bit of an upset because we would have been in the league by then and they would have been a non-league side. So one of the rare Mm. times we've been beaten by a non-league side. And then the second time we played them was on the 6th of November, 1999. Uh, down at Cheltenham, we lost 3-1 in the league. So last time we played them uh, in the league was last season at Brunton Park, where we lost 1-0. Cheltenham completed the double over us. Um, Ruben Reed scored a first-half goal. It was a free kick, wasn't it, where I think a lot of our fans at first were like, oh, he's miles offside, they were miles offside. But actually, watch the replay. It's just appalling defending, wasn't it? And mm. the free kick went in, went through everyone, and about four players were lining up to put it in the back of the net, and Reed tapped it in. He's one of these players who always seems to score against us, doesn't he? Mm. Whether it's for Cheltenham or Exeter or what. He's uh, He's got a habit of scoring. And I think you pointed out, didn't you, that uh, we nearly signed him a few years ago. Yeah, I mean, I had it down in my head that he was on trial here um, around the same time Nathan uh, Tyson was, but I don't think he was actually on trial, but we, we were we were linked with him, certainly. Yeah, he's got one of the biggest arses in football as well, isn't he? He basically mm. just, he's a, he's, he's a good target man who could also find the back of the net, and when he gets the ball back to goal, he, he backs into you, he's really difficult to shake mm. off it. He, he's obviously had his problems, I think, with his uh, his attitude in his earlier years, I think, as a player. But he basically just seems to, to move around those southwest clubs, doesn't he? And mm. he's one of those players who probably should have played at a lot higher level with his ability, but never quite mm. has. Um, no. But he seems fairly settled at Cheltenham at the moment. So, uh, OK, let's just sort of look at where the Robins are doing this season. So the Robins currently find themselves in sixth place in League Two, one point and one place behind United. Their record this season is played 11, won six, drawn one and lost four with a plus six goal difference. I mean, there's not much to, to show between the two teams, really, in terms of league position and stuff like that. It's, it, it's very close. Um, their form of the last six games is a bit patchy, though. They've won three, lost two and drawn once. But they've only won one of their last four games. Uh, they lost last time out in the league, going down 2-1 against Oldham Athletic. In the FA Cup, they made it through to the second round thanks to a 3-1 home win over a non-league side South Shields. And that, that would have been a tough game for them because South Shields have got a bit of money behind them these days, haven't they? I think Julio Arca was there a few years ago. Yeah. Them, I think, and they've had a bit of money thrown at them. It's one of these things. That the non-league scene in the northeast is really, really strong, isn't it? Mm. It's strange. When you look at what a mess Harleyville are, but t- take that away. Darlington are back on their way up. Gateshead are doing fairly well, just considering the financial problems they've had. And also you mentioned their South Shields are doing well, and Blythe have done yeah. well in recent years. Well, there's quite a few uh, like part-time players who were sort of plumbers and builders and all the rest of it. Who were very good players who are earning more from their trade than they would sort of say if a club like Carlisle took a punt on them on a sort of like sort of low wage contract. They're earning more than maybe they would get from well, a well. Look pro at Na- deal. Nathan Buddle, who we signed from Blythe. He, he went back to playing in the non-league Northeast, didn't he? Um, mm. And by all accounts, he was probably earning more doing that, <laughs> playing part-time mm. and in a job. Than he yeah. was from playing with us, and mm. there there are some teams over there. There was at least in the past where, like, factory owners buy teams or people who own businesses buy teams, and what they do is they sign these players up, give them a job with their business. Uh, they don't really do much probably in that job, but <laughs> but they they basically effectively get to train almost full time, 
and earn a decent wedge from it. So, so mm. that's the way that works. Um, their manager is Michael Duff, uh, quite a legendary player at the club. He made over 300 appearances for them. He returned to take charge of the club in 2018 and steadily built them into a team that you expect to challenge for promotion most seasons, don't you, Mike, I think, I'd say? Yeah, I mean, they finished fourth last season, didn't they? Um, mm. And it's always hard going when you're the team that finishes fourth. You know, yeah. obviously, one spot of automatic promotion. Especially last season, as, last season yeah. as well, in the circumstances with obviously the exactly. season ending early. It must yeah. have been pretty tough for them to take that. Um, so yeah, he's uh, built them up to a team that's going to challenge for the playoffs this season. You think um, he previously held a role at Burnley in their academy? I think he was under twenty three manager there. Um, well, he actually made over three hundred appearances for Burnley too, and um, he's he's got a record here of being the first player to be promoted to the Premier League with three different club, well, three three different times with the same club with Burnley. He got promoted all three occasions. They've been promoted to the Premier League. He's been part of their team. Oh. Quite an interesting one that. Um, but yeah, he's, he's he's done a great job there. To be fair to him, um, plenty of good proven lead two performers in their squad, isn't there, Mike? When you look for it, there's a smattering of young talent in there. But mm. you've got players like I mean, Ben Tozer went for big money. I think did he go to Newcastle from Northampton years ago? I think. I think so. Yeah. Might have been Swindon. Yeah. He went from one of the one of the two of them. Anyway, um, he, he he's a player. You know, he's a big lad, isn't he? Big centre back. Um, Chris Hussey, obviously on the back as well. He's been around for years. Um, in midfield, you've got Matty Blair, and I mean Liam Sirkum stood out to me as one of the best signings made by anyone in our division mm. over the summer. I think he's you know, players played at a much higher level than this. They're both in midfield, and obviously you mentioned Ruben Reed, but also you've got Alfie May and Andy Williams up front as well. All you know, three players there got undoubted quality in attack, don't they? Yeah. Well, um, Sean Long as well at, at right back. I'm pretty sure. Aren't we like signed, sealed, and delivered a deal with him? And then Redding came in at the last. Second, a few years ago. Oh, is he the Irish lad? Yes. Yeah, I yeah. Think he is. Yeah, I think he, you might be onto one there. Yeah. So, well, there's a Cali United connection I didn't realise there. So, yeah. So there you go. I was going to say because there's no ex Blues actually in their ranks. No. Obviously, you mentioned the fact that we nearly signed Reed and we nearly signed the lad Long. Um, but obviously, United do have an ex uh, Cheltenham player in their team. That's Gavin Riley. He had a loan spell on them last season. Actually, scored against United in the mm-hmm. defeat down at Warren Road last season. Um, team news. So Gimme Toure is going to serve the final game of his free match ban. Furman Coyote miss out due to international call-ups. Uh, McDonald and Devine sounds like they are going to be available as they got negative tests for their coronavirus tests. I'm not sure Reese Bennett will be involved in this one. You think that maybe they'll hold him back to use him for the Villa under 23s game to build his fitness up with a full 90 minutes maybe? Um, yeah, I mean, he might be on the bench just to sort of have him a part of the, the setup kind of thing. Yeah, it'd be a bit, bit, bit harsh on the legs of Armour if he's on the bench instead of them, I suppose. Oh, I, I agree. Yeah. There you go. Uh, and obviously then in terms of um, long-term injuries, Dickinson, Walker and Dixon uh, still out long-term. Um, interestingly, that Beach had touched this week, though, that uh, first-year pro Tom Wilson is uh, also a defender. He's returned to training now. He had an ankle injury in the summer, didn't he? Very unlucky. He got bad ink. Had mm. to have an operation. Um, but he... I'd imagine they'll probably try and look at get him out on loan once non-league football's back up and running at some point. Uh, a bit unfortunate for the four lads, isn't it? Who are out on loan, they, they they come back to train with us, but they can't actually be involved in the mm. first team. You, it's one of those ones you'd almost want to recall them so they could play in that game against Villa under twenty three, wouldn't you? But mm. but then if it resumes next month, you really want them back at Kendall playing regular football. So bit of a difficult one for us there. But I'd, I'd imagine they'd rather be playing week in week out than come back, play one game, and then be sitting waiting until January when they can return back on loan at someone. Yeah. Um, Shelton Town team news. I've got a little bit of team news for once on the opposition. Very lucky that Shelton Town, their local newspaper, does interviews with the manager where they actually ask him questions about injuries. Very good of them, that. So England under-20 international Josh Griffiths, who's on loan from West Brom, will be unavailable due to being on international duty. Uh, he's a goalkeeper. Funny enough, the fact that he's unavailable, but uh, Marcus Dewhurst wasn't called up to the England under-20 squad this time, was he? So... Marcus can be on the bench for us, but Josh can't be on the bench for them. Uh, experience mm, stopper. Go on, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, he's been their first choice keeper this season as well. He's he has, played yeah. every game. So. He has, yeah. But uh, experience stopper Scott Flinders, uh, he's likely to step in. I think he's been out for 10 months of injury, hasn't he? I think he mm. played his first game against Norwich under-23s in the Pizza Cup on Tuesday night. So uh, you'd imagine he'll come in. He's an experienced stopper, isn't he? He's been around the block. Yeah. But he's one of those ones I've never been very convinced by him. To be honest, I think he's played. Was he at Hartlepool, wasn't he? I think, and I think it's a I few so, times. Yeah. He's, he's flapped a few times against us for them. So hopefully he'll carry on that form for, <laughs> for the game this weekend. Uh, the only other bit of team news for them is that Hull 
on Loney. Elliot Bonds is out for the rest of the season after rupturing his anterior cruciate ligament. So he won't be available for me. That's a sore one, isn't it? Um, predictions, Mike. I was very optimistic, I think it's fair to say, last weekend. I got a bit carried away. I'm always an optimist. And I'm wondering whether I rein it in today, but I'll let you go first here. Well, I, do you know what? I'm optimistic this week. As well. um, Cheltenham had a midweek game in the Pizza Cup, and we didn't as well. So I think they might sort of have some tired legs. Obviously, the first choice keeper's out. Um, so, Ben Carlisle United are probably going to lose, but no, I'll say, yeah. Uh, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to be conf- confident and say 3 0, Carlisle. Ooh, that I is know. Very confident, that yeah. is. Clean sheet, especially. That's a, who are you going for goal scorers? Um, well, that's tough, obviously, because obviously Coyote's out. I reckon you've got to say John Mellish will get two, and I reckon uh, I'll say Gavin Riley again. Why not? Finally going to get his goal. Yeah. Um, I'm going to rein it in big time. I, I, I'm not going to give a defeat. I'm, I, I, I ummed and hard about whether to, to go with a defeat for a laugh, but uh, decided not to. So I'm going to say it's going to be a 2 2 draw. Ooh. And I think Gavin Riley's going to score one. And I fancy Nick Anderton to get one. I reckon okay. maybe a header from a corner or something like that. He's due a goal this season, I think. Got a couple last season, didn't he? But he hasn't got one yet this year. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's the preview stuff done. So let's move on to the X Files. And there's a lot to round up here. I haven't actually put one of them in. I completely forgot to put it in, but I'll I'll, I'll cover that one first then. So a bit of a management news. Um, John Sheridan is on the move again, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. He never he never sits still that fella, does he? Uh, More clubs legs, than Tiger so. Woods. In, indeed he has, indeed he has. Um, so it looks like John Sheridan's about to leave Wigan after just, what, four months in charge, if that, mm. to go to Swindon Town to take on their manager's job, which was vacated after Richie Wellens left them to go drop down to League Two again to join Salford City. Um, mm. I think Wellens was ex-Man United youth, wasn't he? So I think that's probably why the connection yeah. was there in terms of that and... I think it was class of 92 or whatever it was. Yeah, I, think. He, I don't think he was part of class of 92, was he? Oh, but I think he was a few years later than that, I think. But, oh, right. but uh, he was part of Man United set up at, at one point in his career. So yeah, obviously Sheridan has uh, left Wigan. Or I think he's in the process of leaving Wigan to take on the Swindon job. He, the first sign of any issues at a club, he just goes, doesn't he? Mm. part of me kind of wants to respect him for that and the fact that he's just like ah, I've got time for this shit and basically, <laughs> like with us he's like all these lone players are going back ah, sod that mm. I'm, I'm mm. off to to you know take on the Chesterfield job and be the best play manager in League 2 in, in the conference mm. oh wait I've nearly sent them down to the National League North um, yeah so interesting one he, he just doesn't seem to settle anywhere does he but you can't doubt he's he's a decent manager. He can get a team to play, can't he? You know, and he yeah. he's he's very he's very pragmatic sometimes with the way they play, and he you know he'll get them playing good football when he can, and if not, he'll get them playing direct. But and he got a tune out of Hallam Hope for us quite, didn't he? So you'd imagine yeah. that's one of the reasons why he'll he'll do well there. But but yeah, interesting one. He it just doesn't seem to settle anywhere, does he? No, old oh, John. Next up, a bit of transfer news. Um, Canis Carroll. Um, remember him? <laughs> Mm. a debut to remember him wasn't it sent off on his debut against his former club um, yeah. so he's he's finally found himself a new club um, not quite the level I think he would have expected for him uh, Queen's Park in League 2 I think in Scotland mm. um, joining ex-United defender and fellow Presley signing Peter Grant at Hamden Park they've had a bit of money behind them haven't they because I think they sold Hamden Park to the SFA and I think they're investing a bit of that into their team now and I think they've because they've, they used to be amateur didn't they they were I the think only full time now, aren't they? I don't know if they're full time, but they're definitely uh, at least semi pro level now. They used to be just amateur level, so I think they only uh, got very basic pay with the players. So he's joined them. That is quite a fall from grace because he, he left obviously he was at Oxford, I think, wasn't he? As a youngster to go to um to Brentford. It was one of these places, you know, big things are expected of him. And he, wasn't like a six figure sum as well when he went to Brentford. Something like three hundred grand, possibly maybe yeah, more than yeah. that. And it really has not worked out for him and he just dropped off and he just hasn't really one of these things you go to a club and you just sit in there beat him or in a 20 freeze rage and Brentford have a decent setup for that but it's not the same as playing football week in week out and that, that mm. shows really doesn't it he just never was quite up to the pace for us I don't think no I mean he, he looked good in his last like few games for us and then yeah. I think Presley got sat Beach came in and he never featured again yeah Be- Beach just didn't have time for him did he I think Beach mm. really wasn't it, there's a couple of players I think Beach took one look at straight away maybe looked at their attitudes and thought nah because it's interesting, yeah. I, I noted the other day that it was Mo Sagat's birthday and he's, he's not got a club still. 
No, exactly. And a, a lot of us thought he looked like a good, promising player. And yeah. There you go. Yeah, we nearly got a flag made for him, didn't we? We <laughs> Thank God we didn't. <laughs> yeah. there. That would have been embarrassing. Um, but yeah, he's one of those ones, isn't he, Mo Sakafu? You wonder if maybe his agent is filling his head with ideas of how good he really is and pushing his expectations beyond the levels that they really should be at. Mm. Um, another bit of transfer news. Nathan Thomas has finally got a new club. It took him a while as well, didn't it? He signed for mm. Hamilton Academicals. Um, a, a kind of a decent level, but a smaller club at a decent level. It's one of those ones where he's been paid so well at Sheffield United, he's probably struggled to find a play at a club that fits the level he wants to be at and will pay him the wage he wants. And we obviously weren't going to be at that level and we, we've made our signings and there was rumours that he'd come back to us and, you know, said, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm keen if you, if you want me. And we got to the point where well, we don't really need you anymore. Mm. So a bit, a bit sad, really, he hasn't been able to find himself a lover because he's, he's, he's a player who's clearly got bags of ability, hasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. But I, I'm not entirely convinced that Hamilton could offer him massive wages in comparison to, to us, say. But, you know, for us to say that we don't need him and our forward players aren't scoring goals is a bit yeah. concerning. I suppose we're probably looking at it as well. We've got Dickinson to come back in January. Yeah, that's you true. Really, Dickinson is maybe doesn't score as many, but he's a very similar player to Thomas, mm. isn't he? Do you really need two players of the similar ilk in the team? Probably mm-hmm. not. Especially as both will be on decent wages, wouldn't they? You mm-hmm. really don't want to end up in a situation like that. <laughs> so let's get on to the goals. This is a very busy week for goals, isn't it? In terms of former players. So deep breath here. So Jordan Cook scored, I think, what I presume is his first goal for Gateshead. There's a player who probably should have played at a much higher level as well. Mm-hmm. In the Blackpool game, they won against, I can't remember, it was someone in the uh, was it East, Eastbourne? Eastbourne Borough, maybe something like that, or Eastley? Right. One of the two, anyway. Clue. In the FA Cup. Three goals for them and all three were ex Carlo players. So Gary Medine got two and Jerry Yates got one in their win. Joe Garner got a goal for Wigan in their FA Cup shock defeat against Chorley. Uh, Jamie Devitt scored again. I mean, scored against us. He scored again for Newport. Have you seen this goal? It, no, it's, no. It's basically absolutely vintage Devitt. Sort of picks it up from the left, cuts inside, beats a man, and then from 25 yards puts it in the top corner. I'll send you the link later, Mike. I'll put it on there. Oh, no. Twitter for you if I get the chance it's an absolute belting goal and does sort of make you think oh if only if only mm. but hey we've got Big John so we don't need him so there you go <laughs> here's a blast from the past Adam Campbell he scored two goals for Darlington in their FA Cup win over Swindon the ginger um, Maradona as he in, was called he's one of those players he, he, he's such a small stature and the way he played You've got to play a particular way to use him, haven't you, really, at our mm. level? You've got to have him always playing just behind the strikers, and not all clubs are going to do that, are they? So it's no. a difficult one for him. He's never quite found a club where he can play regularly, and he seems to be quite happy at Darlington. I think he's doing quite well there, so good luck to the lad. Next up, this is one I'm loving, David Raven. We mentioned him a few times recently. We? Um, mm. Scored in the penalty shootout for Marine in their win over Colchester. I watched a bit of that game, an absolute belting match that was. Proper mm. end-to-end stuff, and Colchester dominated for long periods, but Marie kept hitting them on the break and could have won it in normal time with a couple of chances they had. Fair play to them. Um, so, yeah, uh, Big Ravo scored in that penalty shootout. He also apparently took a, a ball to a, a very delicate area during <laughs> the game. I saw a tweet about that. Um, mm. so, yeah, it's a good well, old Ravo. Well, he Go does on. have big balls, so the... So the song goes. So. Indeed, indeed. I remember that <laughs> back in the day. And uh, the final two goals, you've got uh, Mark Beck scored for Harrogate in their FA Cup first round winner. But that's his first goal of the season, possibly. I don't think he's scored in the league yet, but I think he's been setting up a few. So he's done pretty well. And then Sam Cosgrove, back in the goals for Aberdeen. Um, some interesting comments about the fact why he turned down his move to, to France recently, actually. Uh, well worth a read. Next up, international call-ups. And we can update this one a little bit further, can't we? So mm. Jared Branthwaite and James Trafford both ex-United uh, in one form or another. Obviously, Jared played for the first team. James Trafford was part of our academy before he went to Man City. Both being called up to the England under-19 squad for this period. I'm not sure they're playing any games. I think they might be playing a couple of behind-closed-doors ones, maybe, mm. during the uh, the break at St. George's Park. They were supposed to play two games, but I think they were called off originally. Um, but the big bit of news is Dean Henderson. Mm. Called up to the England squad and he finally made his debut last night, didn't he? Yeah, in the, uh, I mean, so in the game against Ireland. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing all sorts of different figures banded about for how much we get. Yeah. I've heard six figure fee, seven figure fee, but whatever it is, obviously, uh, it's it's more than welcome at, at this time. Oh, of course, it is. Cool. This is it's great news for us. I mean, the the, the rumor I've heard is that we get 
a smaller fee for making his debut in a friendly game and then once he makes his debut in a full competitive international we'll get a bigger fee mm. on top of that the rumour is we would have only got the bigger fee if he'd made his debut in a competitive game and we wouldn't have got uh, okay. sort of fee for playing a friendly so it's actually worked out better for us that mm. he's made his debut in a friendly um, obviously we've still got to wait for him to make his Premier League debut and we'll probably get a decent bit of money for that as well so yeah. and once that's done just just need Man United to sell him for 60 million and get our sell on fee <laughs> that, that'll, exactly. that'll do just fine just hope David uh, David De Gea managed to keep up his good form for the next couple of years and yeah. feels he's got no choice but to leave um mm. A bit mean that, isn't it, really? Saying that, but, uh, <laughs> but there you go. Well, I think that's it, Mike, isn't it? Um, mm. That rounds it up for this this week. F- uh, thanks very much for joining me again. Uh, yeah. Really do appreciate it. Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of the specials, we still haven't got rounds of recordings from the others, and I still haven't finished putting together the um, the one from the 05 06 season. I, I, I've, I've been working on it. I think part one's almost done, but I'll, uh, I'll have it sorted soon, I hope. And we're going to record the special about the fans 11 aren't we i think and your favorite mm. 11 next yeah. week at some point and the kit one i should be doing with dan at some point next week as well because i've finished doing the script for that as well actually so that should be a good fun one to do so yeah obviously if you've got any comments or feedback you, you can contact us in the usual places you should know them by now but it's bruntonbugle at gmail.com and at bruntonbugle on twitter um you can obviously subscribe to the podcast we'd advise you do so you get every week when it comes out um you do that on any good podcast app so acast um, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcast. Basically, if you search for Brunton Bugle, you'll find it there. Click subscribe and obviously give us a review as well, so then more people will find it and we get more people listening. Uh, it'd be great news for everyone. Okay, should we have a look at the map, Mike? See if there's any new yeah. countries on there. Uh, all the regulars are still on there. Um, on the new ones, Kenya's still listening. Oh, oh, we've got a new boy. We've got a new one into the team, Belgium. Oh. The Belgian Blues are listening in Brussels as well. Maybe someone in the it, EU is listening it, it, to us. Who is that Belgian lad we had from Manchester United? I still haven't got a oh, clue how to say his name. Sh- Shanri Ekamanga. Ain't, that's the it's one, like that. yeah. Funny enough, Dan talked about him with me the other day. He sent me a message saying, you never guess where he's playing. I think he's playing somewhere like in Ibiza maybe or somewhere like that, I think. He told me exactly right where he was playing. And if some random country... But um, it's lower leagues in a in a country somewhere far away. I can't remember exactly when. But it's one of those ones we're going to do maybe an episode mm. at some point of where are they now? People who've played maybe a three or four games who are playing in random, very lower down leagues and talk about them possibly and you know get, 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 have a bit of crack about that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly. I'm trying to find it here because Dan did send me something. There you go. Uh, Tenerife. He plays in Tenerife for a regional team. There you go. That, that 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 is a low level, isn't it? Dropping down mm. quite a bit. Then he basically leaves after four games because he felt he could push his way into Man, something like Man United's <laughs> yeah. bench or something like that. So something utterly ridiculous like that. And then he never had a decent loan spell after that. I think. Yeah. So yeah, typical football, isn't it? Anyway, okay. So I think the next episode is going to be next or well, next proper episode will be next weekend. We're not going to do one for the Papa John's nonsense against Villa. We no. really couldn't care less about that. We might briefly talk about it in the next episode just if any of the youngsters come on and feature in that game but I mean it's, it's one of the most pointless games going isn't it really mm. I mean both teams are out there's a packed fixture list right now why didn't someone just have the common sense to say this is actually going to cost us money to run this game so let's just agree to sort of yeah, exactly. not play the game and you know obviously if we don't play a strongish team we're breaking the rules and get fined it's ridiculous <sighs> outrageous isn't it it's stupid Okay, Mike, I think that's done it for this week, so thanks everyone for listening, uh, and up the blues!